Hey, this is William for Attack of the Fanboy.com. I'm here with Kyle. Kyle, this is Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom. Unfortunately, yeah. they sent me this game and uh, <laughs> not you because you were, you know, more of a Nino Kuni fan. I've never played the yeah. original. So I played a lot of the original and I have the. Um, collector's edition that is like really tough to find it's it's a genuine collector's edition that only collectors got really <laughs> it's not like one of those that's like still sitting on store shelves hmm. those things are really expensive yeah this was a kind of like a very highly rated beloved game in the last generation I loved it. it's yeah it was so good yeah well i so i'm coming from a, a spot where i don't really have a point of reference for like what uh you know what has changed significantly uh, i'm i'm pretty sure i think the battle systems have changed totally different yep yeah yeah just from what i've seen and i got to play it at uh e3 last year so kind of got got a look at some of it and yeah it's it's very different yeah i, I not surprisingly i mean i used to love playing the uh, good rpg but uh this one has kind of sunk its teeth in just because of, as you can see here, we're getting into the combat a little bit. Uh, it's all real time combat. And I just was kind mm. of under, I, I haven't been following this game that much. And I just kind of assumed that it would have been like a turn based. It was the last game mm. like that. So, I mean, the last game was completely different. So it was, it was played in real time, but you decided, first of all, you didn't even control your own, character it was um it was almost pokemon ish you caught these uh animals i i'm gonna use bad terminology because it's been years since i played this game but familiars. you caught all of, yes familiars um and so you you caught them and you used them in battle and basically you commanded them to either attack defend or counter i think there were three options and it was it was it played out in real time but you were controlling it in more of a turn base. I think. I think when you asked me, I, I compared it to Knights of the Old Republic because it. I think it felt more like that, where you're kind of saying, you know, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be attacking, mm -hmm. and then that would play out, and then you would change it to defend or change or use a special stuff like that. But no, I mean the combat is completely reworked from this. Yeah, and it, and I kind of like that more hands-on approach because, I mean, for me personally, it's a. Uh, you know, it always feels like you have a chance to mm -hmm. win a fight, no matter how high level the enemy is. I guess if that makes sense. Uh, sure. So you're like yeah. rolling around, dodging around, using your uh, different weapons. You can switch between each character uh, within the battle. You have, uh, as the story progresses, you have a, a lot of people in your party that are playable characters, but uh, you can only switch between the three characters that you have kind of grouped up at the time okay and then yeah, you so can then you can you see those little guys running around those i guess are the equivalent of the familiars but they're called higgledies <laughs> and uh, that, yeah i'm sure you loved that name what i oh, know i mean I'm, I'm into it at this point um okay. the, the higgledies are uh, interesting because they all have unique sort of abilities and they'll light up uh this is early gameplay when i just started like trying to figure out the systems but the Higgledies will light up a circle, and if you can roll over to the circle or get, say I hit it here, and then these guys are going to form uh, like a cannon because that's their that's their ability, and they start sh barraging mm -hmm. this enemy with that. The the purple guys over there sh shoot out this like uh, big energy ball. Uh, the green ones heal you. Um, you know, the, okay. and there's different. You know, as your story progresses, you can get new ones through exploration you can uh you know train them in this over world kingdom that you're building this game is like incredibly deep in a way that i wasn't expecting i thought it was going to be more mm -hmm. of like a linear sort of rpg i i, I don't know mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean they they've expanded it a lot. I know like that whole city city building stuff mm -hmm. is all new. Um, the first game, the first game was probably what what you were expecting. It was pretty 
I wouldn't say linear. I mean, it was still kind of open, but it was, you know, your, your story beats were one after the other. And, and unless you really tried to go out of your way, you could just kind of play from start to finish in a couple dozen hours or so. And, and then the end game was where everything really kind of opened up. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like they, they made this more robust and, and, and deeper all around just from the stuff that I've heard. I would say that it's robust. Uh, I can't divulge um, everything about it, but uh, you know, I think there is definitely you know, that end game that you're talking about in this. But uh, I think it goes a little bit deeper uh, with with some of that 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 city building stuff and recruiting citizens to that city, and that's kind of like the main way that they tie in the side quests of the game, and it, it they do it in a way where. It makes the game feel, I guess a good way to put it is more organic because you're going to these different cities. Uh, the, the overarching plot of this Revenant Kingdom is you play as Evan uh, Pettywhisker, I think, and he's the guy with the cape over there and the cat ears. Yep, that's he's uh, that's a thing from the first game. Okay, people with cat ears. Yeah, I forget. I forget what what the species is called in in the lore of this game, but um, it definitely has a name. So he's been ousted from his kingdom, and then uh, you know he's out on this journey to, I guess, unify the whole world under one banner, kind of. So a dictator. He wants to be ruler of the world. <laughs> Basically, but you know they want to do it in, in a peaceful in a peaceful way. He wants okay. to help people. Uh, and there's kind of this backstory going on uh, where the rulers of these worlds are kind of being corrupted. So they're you know on a fight or a mission to kind of undo that and unify uh, the world. But I don't want to get too much into the mm-hmm. story. Uh, so yeah. Nino Kuni 2 is a lot of big boss battles. <laughs> it's a lot of yeah. ex- exploration like you saw in uh, you know the first part of this video. And as you're running in the big overworld, you saw like enemies will run at you. You can run at enemies and, and instigate fights. You also have like dungeons uh, which will kind of usually culminate in something like this where you're fighting... Um, a boss battle with with mm-hmm. with a bigger uh, enemy have those been cool and like are, are there variations on them or are they just mostly you know spam attack as much as possible you know at the very beginning of the game it it did feel a little bit mashy like oh this is no problem but there's there's a definitely steep curve once you start getting into the middle of the game where if you haven't if you've been kind of, you know, skating by the enemies when you should have been fighting them or, um, you know, maybe you, there's, you can escape uh, when you get into an instance, a, a fight sequence. You can escape by running to an end and like an edge barrier in a lot of fights. So if you maybe are running through some of the fights you should be fighting and, and not uh, doing everything you should be doing you get to a point in the game where you're like, oh, I'm way under-leveled for what I'm supposed to be doing. So, Yeah, I mean, has that happened a lot? Do you need to stop and grind uh, um, pretty often? Or I, I, know when we, I, I know when I play didn't. a game for review, I play it a little different. So sometimes I rush through. So maybe that's... Yeah. You're, I, you're doing okay? I, it's felt pretty good at definitely ramped up a little bit in difficulty but the where they gate you in this game is in the city building stuff so it all kind of comes together um, nicely in that front because you get some backstory you you get some leveling but uh, here we're going to get into kind of the kingdom building aspect of it and yeah I don't know how far I am into the game here probably around uh, the sixth chapter but uh, you can do a lot of stuff in here, which also makes kind of the progression elements of it a little bit easier. So you can level up your, your Higgledies with uh, items that you find in the world. They all 
love certain things depending on which higgledy it is. So you can also level up all these uh, different structures in the town, uh, collect gold from uh, the town that it's generating. Um, as I said, you can level up your higgledies and purchase armor, uh, make weapons, uh, change your magic, and you've got like 50 buildings within this town that you can spend money on and kind of improve your influence across uh, the world. Cool. So, yeah, it is, it's an interesting mechanic that, that kind of plays into uh, the overarching theme of the game. Um, it also helps you as you progress. So as things start getting harder, um, you know, you can purchase the things that you need straight from your town instead of kind of either trying to find them out in the world uh, through treasure chests and, and different items that you'll find kind of in the overworld and dungeons. Um, but you can also, as you kind of recruit characters into this, into your kingdom, uh, they all have different abilities. So uh, people with a mining expertise can improve the output of certain materials. People with a magic uh, background can be put into um, that building to you know, allow you to make things more powerful, um, more powerful spells, um, different spells that you uh, wouldn't have access to otherwise. Uh, if you put an armor in the armor shop, they can make you better stuff uh, and make you better stuff more quickly. Okay. Are you, like, are you enjoying doing this stuff or is it sort of feeling like you're having to micromanage everything? Or you know, there, you know, do, you, do you go in here when you just want to have fun? Well, the it's kind of your hub. So as the story plays out, you're always coming back here. So it's kind of where you meet with everybody in your party after everything. So it gives you enough opportunity to come back and do these things kind of just in the natural progression for it. But if you're like really wanting to save up money for a certain thing or because uh, some of the stuff is quite expensive as you start getting to the upper end of the kingdom building stuff. Um, it can take hours to accumulate the amount of money that you need for it. So you, it, once you kind of get on a path of like, oh, I want to build this certain thing and it's going to cost me 50,000 points or guilders or is what it's called. You do kind of get back in that thing. Well, maybe I should go back to the kingdom, see how much I have, collect it. Because you can only hold a certain amount of resources in your coffers at, at, at a time. So you want to keep going back, collecting it. Is there a bit of micromanagement to it? Uh, yes, but it's so far it's been pretty enjoyable and pretty streamlined into the experience, except for the spots where it gates you. If you haven't been naturally progressing enough, uh, you will hit points where it'll say like, yeah, we'll do this, but you have to do this first and then you can have uh, you know, another hurdle in front of you for kind of completing uh, specific story missions and stuff. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I know a lot of JRPGs have some stuff that they, yeah, they always put those hurdles in front of you. But sometimes, you know, if it's something like this, at least it, it kind of breaks up the action, I guess. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, a lot to manage here. You, you don't have everybody that you need at, at first and you need to kind of go out into the world and recruit people from the towns that you've kind of signed this agreement with to be at peace and and mm -hmm. you'll bring these people in and some of them as you saw in the menu are suitable for certain structures and others aren't yep. so it's kind of like you're going back in and checking and reorganizing and i mean that's really the kind of the game here is getting it to peak performance i guess uh, but there's really no, it's kinda, there's, it doesn't, the rewards are just, you know, making it easier on you. I, at least from what I've seen so far, unless there's some end game where you're um, using this stuff in a different way. Uh, that's all I've seen so far. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of reminiscent to me of, of Fallout 4's settlements, but better. <laughs> 
Would you would you agree with that? I, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, in, in that game, it wasn't nearly as as involved, and they didn't necessarily bring you back to those settlements in order to you know make any story progression. I, I mean, at least I played through that game without doing much of the story. Uh, I mean, without doing yeah. much of the settlement stuff at all. Yeah, I pretty much just came back to it whenever the game was over. But yeah, I'm the same. I ignored it. Yeah, so this is a... Uh, I think they've been really pushing Goldpaw since they have been showing this game. It's one of the more beautiful areas uh, in in the kingdom. And it, it's kind of one of those show pieces for uh, the visuals of the game, I, I would say. Yeah, which, I mean, just looking at this video, it looks great. Um, you know, I, I kind of talked to you a little bit about the first one. That was the art style was like the selling point. Like the game was the game was almost secondary to the art and um, everything like that because they had brought in Studio Ghibli to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and here, you know, Ghibli is kind of around, but not really. Um, so they got some Ghibli people to work on this, the the big ones. I can't remember their names, but I know I wrote something from last E3 about how they essentially brought the talent from Ghibli. And, I mean, you can see it. This this just is great. The art style is gorgeous. The game looks great. And this, is this like a casino? T what kind of town is this? It is. It's a, they decide everything on the roll of a dice. Really? <laughs> and then this cuts. They, they cuts were good about coming up with these rolling yeah. the dice on taxes <laughs> yeah i remember i mean there weren't a ton of towns in the first game but each one was really interesting and unique so as you can see here like or here here you're not getting a full voiceover sort of experience for all of the dialogue in the game and for jrpg fans you might be used to that sort of thing but on a high end like a game that looks like this and and has the features of it for me someone who's not into this sort of game i'm sitting here looking at it and going oh my god if this was full voiceover all the time this would be uh, just an incredible experience but uh, I, I think that's been my one sticking point with it so far is that you have a lot of these silent conversations in big moments of of the the narrative uh, when you meet new characters. Um, it, a lot of it is left up to your imagination. Hmm. Yeah, I mean that happens a lot with these sorts of Japanese games, especially the ones with a ton of dialogue. Yeah. Um, so not surprising, but I, I do understand why that'd be disappointing. I can't. I think the first game was complete was the exact same. Um, it also did have a lot more. Um, well, I don't know if it had more, but it, it really focused on the full-blown cutscenes because the first one had actual animated cutscenes, whereas this is all in-engine. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know which one had more voices than the other, but I think it was pretty similar. So I'm kind of used to it at this point, um, but I get why you'd be a little... Yeah, little this is the perfect example of it. Like you have Before you're talking to these guys, they don't say anything. He does a very short cutscene where it is voiced and then it goes back to no voices at all and it's it's just a weird sort of i don't know disjointed sort of presentation aspect to it and for me personally of course i would like to see this whole thing uh you know voice but so the remainder of this video is going to be some of the other aspects of this game which there are many this is uh kind of a high-end boss tainted uh, i think they're called tainted creatures where uh, these are found all over the world and are kind of just extra challenges that you'll find in the overworld some of them you'll encounter on uh, different types of side missions but uh, as you can see like the battle landscape has changed but these enemies are incredibly tough and um you know it's just one of the many other things that are in this game like you have these tainted enemies you have uh, these eight level dungeons that get harder as you take each step and you have to collect orbs to, uh, to keep um that you can pay to these shrines to get your level down which hmm. keeps you alive for longer um i mean this this looks 
This looks cool. I mean, I, I don't know how the combat feels. It, it but. feels great. It's got, it's basically got two, you have a high, uh, a heart attack and a light attack. And then you have a sidearm, which you can fire. And then you can also use magic and your higgledy. So you're controlling quite a bit in the actual combat. But yeah, it, it plays, it plays as good as it looks. I would, I would definitely say that it plays as good as it looks. Nice. Um, this is actually towards the middle of the game where, you know, I was getting a little bit more familiar with the combat, doing a lot more rolling, but at this point still, I'm, I'm still playing the game, uh, trying to finish it. So I don't know, I have hit some walls, uh, in combat where it's gotten kind of frustrating. Some like controller breaking, like, holy shit, this is tough. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that's because I wasn't leveled for it or, um, if I, you know, just was having a bad, uh, bad time with a specific enemy type, but yeah, they, they, the combat's varied. You, you have a lot of variation in the enemies that you're going to face, uh, in, in the bosses that you're going to face, um, and in the environments uh, that that you're going to do this combat in. Hmm. But there's also a real-time strategy element to this game. Have they showed that uh, to you no. at all? No. Oh, I, I didn't know I if they showed that, that at, at E3. But yeah, I don't there's, think so. There's a real-time strategy kind of... I, I don't even know what it's there for, to be honest with you. It's kind of like stuck into some side quests throughout the game. Hmm. But you basically recruiting these different parts of your army and you can it's like a rocks paper scissors sort of thing you're you're running around with these kind of orbiting units uh one will be like archers and one will be like melee uh, and it's basically on a color system of red green blue and yellow and like i believe it's like green beats blue and red beats green and yellow beats red something like that but you have to kind of rotate these units um as you are kind of running across the battlefield the different you'll have to take your uh, armies out onto these battlefields during the game for a number of different side quests there are some that you'll just encounter out in the world where there are stakes in the ground and you can engage in these these battles uh, there are others where you'll want to recruit a general or something to your kingdom. So you'll have to perform a, like a test of, or whatever, where you are, mm. you know, you have to beat a certain level and then the, that person will come to your kingdom. Uh, I, I don't know if there are any like end game implications for, uh, you know, how this plays out. If there is some sort of, final battle or anything like that i have no clue but uh i've i've run into okay. it probably four times since i've been playing the game for yeah. 30 hours but i haven't been looking looking for it you know uh there are these stakes like you can basically go and do whatever you want in this game so if you want to go looking for these battles you can find them all across the the world. If you want to go looking for those tainted monsters, you can. If you want to go looking for uh, the different mm. dungeons, uh, you can do that as well. But <laughs> it, it is a like it is a many they, faceted thing. Yeah, Kyle, they added Kingdom layers onto an already to Revenant King pretty layered game. Although they did take away the uh, the Pokemon aspect of it. I guess you you do get these Higgledies, um, but that always kind of felt a little tacked on anyway. So I'm I'm okay with them removing that if. Um, if they added all this other stuff that's in here. Yeah, but it's, it's I mean, it comes together well. It's not just a bunch of, of uh, single things. It, it feels cohesive. Um, this stuff, uh, this stuff's probably on the outlier of like, oh, mm. I'm not really interested in this part of the game. You know, it's not as engaging as, say, the, you know, real-time combat. But... I don't know. It could get better as I don't know how much more I have left with the game, but we will see. We'll have our review up uh, probably in a week here. 
uh, when the review embargo lifts, but that was Nino Kuni 2, as much as we can say about it for now. Uh, you can check back on our YouTube channel for our final review. For Kyle, I'm William, and thanks for watching. <laughs>